All right. I will record this as well. So in case anybody wants to copy later, we could talk about that. I think we have a good number. So what's going to happen first is, um, uh, let me just give you an overview, everybody, what's going to happen today. Uh, I will introduce myself and the things I do after this, and I will talk about what I really mean by pangolin tourism. All right. Uh, after that, uh, we will have a question and answer session, basically discussion. The floor will be all yours, everybody. Basically, anybody can ask any question. You can disagree. You can agree. You can give your point of view. All right. And uh, it's just let's have a nice constructive uh, discussion. That's the main objective. Actually, before I do the introduction, I have done a poll. I want to see. I actually made a poll. Uh, if any, if everybody, can, I, I don't know how to use Paul properly, so I'm still learning. Uh, I'm going to launch a poll. If all of you can just answer in 10 seconds, I want to ask this poll before and after the discussion. So I just want to see people's opinions. The first question is, is pangolin tourism a way to save the species? Uh, yes, no, other means maybe, but I don't think you can elaborate. But if you guys can answer this first. If you think pangolin tourism is a way to save the species, is it a poss it, it, is it, you know, if you think it can help. I'll close the uh, poll in around 10 seconds from now. Five. Three, two, one. Okay. Wow. I will share the results. And I've not done it right. But anyways, it's pretty consistent that at the moment people think, 50% of you think yes. 50% of you think yes. 19% of you think no, which is six of you. 16 and others are 31 percent i will take that as on the border okay i will share the screen i will do introduction um wendy can you can you uh see the screen can you see the presentation can you see the logo okay okay ladies and gentlemen welcome to this discussion today. I am so happy that we have people from all over the world today, from the United States, from South Africa, you know, we have people from Ghana, we have from people from Middle East, we have people from India, we have people from Pakistan, Malaysia, you know, this is amazing. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't name all your countries. We have people who work in NGOs, travel companies and plantations. We have professors here. This is perfect. This is great to have people from, uh, a wide scope of people. So great. Okay. So my name is Chavez China. All right. And I'm the founder of One Stop Borneo Wildlife. It's a conservation organization based on Borneo. Uh, we started in 2012. We do research on animals. We do res rescues and we develop sustainable conservation uh, tourism projects to help different kind of animals. Uh, for example, we work on dolphins. We work on uh, elephants as well. Uh, and most importantly, we work on pangolins. Uh, this is a pangolin, Sunda pangolin, which uh, we had rescued. We have done over 30 rescues of pangolins on Borneo. And this pangolin was being sold by a hunter. We convinced him to give it to us. This is a 16 kilogram pangolin. So we were very happy to have it released back. Um, so as you all know, pangolins are usually uh, hunted for the scale, you know, and, and the meat as well. That, that's very sad. I'm not going to go too much into detail because you guys know more about pangolins and the threats it's facing. But basically, uh, the pangolins are, are facing extinction because of poaching all over the world from, you know, the four species in Africa, four species in Asia, and they're being hunted out. So it's quite um, sad that what is happening to the pangolins. So I just want to uh, talk about this one. We 
have a program on Borneo where we train hunters to become guides. I know a lot of hunters myself, and I'm sure some of you are already working with them. Um, I, I can all I can say to you is that most of the poachers who I know, 99% of them are not bad people. Many of them are good people as well, you know. And you see, we are all privileged here, sitting in this laptop, uh, watching this uh, presentation, or a nice aircon room, or wherever we are. We're privileged people. We go to schools. We have, you know, we have nice work. These people want some of these hunters want the same thing for their families, and you know, um, they just want to hunt, you know, uh, uh, make money and uh, have a nice time with their family. So what we basically do is train these people to become guides or change their livelihoods. We say, why um, why um, get $10 a day, uh, $10 by selling a pangolin or $20 by selling a pangolin when we can give you $10, $20 a day for bringing in people and doing wildlife tourism, for example, in general. You know, So this is one uh, thing we try to do with hunters. And um, because most of the people who hunt these animals, these hunters or local people, they are not very well off, at least the people who I know. I, you guys might have a different experience. Now, it has been a debate, what is this pangolin tourism topic I'm trying to talk about? Somebody said, are you trying to breed them and everything? No, no, no. So what we're trying to say is, we want to do wild pangolin watching. Yeah, uh, we want to watch pangolins in the wild. How? Uh, doing night drives, for example, you know, uh, looking for pangolins in different parts. Uh, I will give an example after this. Uh, or put transmitters on them and then maybe follow them and uh, we could watch pangolins like that. That's the type of pangolin tourism I'm talking about, wild pangolins, yeah? Now I'm gonna give you some existing examples of pangolin tourism and some potential examples. In Sabah and Brunei, uh, Sabah and Brunei are on the island of Borneo. Sabah is in Malaysia, Brunei is a country. There are some wildlife companies which actually do existing night drives looking for pangolins, okay? Of course, the chances are very low, but they have found them before. But uh, if you just rely your company on pangolin tourism by doing night drives, the chances are, well, yeah, let's, it's very low, minimal. In Ghana, I know a guide who does pangolin tourism on white and black-bellied pangolin. So he doesn't tr attract them, I think. He, I mean, he doesn't put transmitters on them. He just um, tracks them from his ex expertise. Uh, there's certain private reserves in South Southern Africa, actually, who have tracked pangolins by putting transmitters on as well. Uh, they've told, asked me not to mention them, but they're private companies doing private branch. Uh, okay. Uh, Sangha Lodge, Rod, this, I put this in before I actually knew you. I just researched. I read on Sangha Lodge uh, website, uh, they actually have ha have or had three black-bellied pangolins tracked daily by trackers. Uh, I believe they're doing this for research, I think, but uh, I'm just thinking this could be an amazing idea if you could just bring in high-end mammal watchers of uh, wildlife people and watch these uh, pangolins. A lot of organizations here uh, also have a rescue and release service. We have had in the past, uh, people have uh, attended our release programs when we released the pangolin and they gave a donation for it and we use the money, let's say, for paying the vet or the transport. Because you see, when you're an NGO, paying all these bills, you know, the money doesn't fall from the sky and you, you guess you can rely on donations all the time, but that's not sustainable, you know, and it's not really creating a value as well. So maybe this is an idea. Whenever you do a rescue and release, you can invite certain people in a society or tourists and uh, maybe they can give a contribution and uh, you can use the contribution for uh, so on. Researchers, researchers are, let's say, on, they're on Borneo, for example, there are people who are tracking pangolins for research in Africa as well, in other parts of Southeast Asia. Could you imagine if um, uh, these researchers who are tracking them allowed visitors or tourists to come with them and, you know, the money could be used for their research or, you know, hiring local people and so on. So these are some ex existing examples of pangolin tourism happening around the world and potentials. Now, this is the type. So this is a pangolin we tracked once and we, we it was a rescued pangolin, by the way. Uh, so we put a transmitter on, we did it uh, with certain pangolin researchers and we tracked it successfully for a week and it was great. But it was too, it, it was too difficult in the Borneo rainforest, the canopy being thick and we didn't have enough money and time basically to fall it all the time. But 
it was possible, but it was very labor intensive, at least on Borneo. My friends from India and Pakistan and uh, in Namibia have told me it's easier over there because the canopy is less thick in certain parts. Uh, these are certain comments by <clears throat> pangolin researchers. One is from Nick. He's a quite re renowned uh, pangolin researcher from Taiwan. He, his comment for, he couldn't maybe <clears throat> attend this uh, session, maybe he is actually here now. He said, the idea for pangolin ecotourism for me is that we train, <clears throat> we can train the local people to monitor the pangolin behavior, example, burrow usage. Once the local people can monitor the surrounding po po pangolin populations, they can use this skill as an attraction for an ecotourism experience. Mm. Jennifer Lawson says, if pangolins can be tracked by researchers for science, why not tourism? Uh, the following is my opinion, humble uh, opinion, two cents. Local communities which are hunting could use this new incentive. This will pump money in the local economy, hire local people. Research is important too. You know, uh, but I think pumping in the money, pumping money in the economy like tourism could be very useful. An anonymous researcher who doesn't want to be named, he told uh, me that if scientists can track for research, why not for a bigger purpose, job creation, creating positive value for pangolins, and it's working in some areas. So we actually are going to start a pilot project on the Indian pangolin. Uh, in Pakistan and India with some local uh, researchers. Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Re researchers this year, it was supposed to be in April, but due to this COVID crisis, it's going to be shifted back a little bit. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we just want to work on the Indian pangolin there in this area, which is a bit more open. And uh, the pangolin in that part of the world is being affected big time because of China has invested $60 billion on this uh, new highway and Silk Road in that area. So the trade has gone mad. So we're going to kickstart the project over there. If it's successful, we might do domestic tourism or do, you know, uh, bring in mammal watches from all over the world. Second phase will be in Borneo, if it is successful. Um, some people said, uh, who wants to see a pangolin? A lot of people don't even know if a pangolin exists or what is a pangolin. But I can tell you there are wildlife watches out there and mammal watches out there who would come and see a pangolin. Um, basically, in conclusion, what I wanted to say was the pangolin tourism, which we talk, which I'm just talking about, is wild pangolins. Most of them are released pangolins, rescued, uh, released pangolins. We could put transmitters on them. We could follow them in the wild. We, nobody's, we're not going to disturb them. If, if there is, a let's say, a tracked pangolin, we track it. If you see it from a distance or you know we, we will not disturb it to take a selfie or a picture it has to be it has to be done properly it has to be a proper sop it has to be ethically done uh, they have very strict rules and it's not mass tourism this is niche tourism and uh, high-end wildlife tourism this is the idea i've given some examples of um pangolin watching which is happening right now and the potential which is happening right now this is all i actually wanted to share and somebody wants to join. Basically, yeah, that's the idea. Now, okay, uh, I, I think uh, all these questions in there, I'm not, okay. What we're gonna do is now the floor is open. Anybody can ask a question, agree, disagree, have their own opinion, or she want to share your experience. You know, so if uh, yeah, uh, Wendy maybe can go first uh, as she has raised her hand. And okay. hi everyone, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Wendy Paneno from South Africa. Um, I've been working with pangolins for the past five years uh, in the Kalahari region. So compared to most of you that are working with pangolins, it's been <laughs> relatively easy to find them um, in the nice soft sand. Um, the main focus has been looking at the potential effects of climate change on pangolins. But I do work on a reserve where we do have a lodge, and so we have a huge uh, demand to see pangolins. Um, it is one of the best places within South Africa to see pangolins, so we do get a, a big demand for people to come there. And I do find that it has worked really well to, to first of all, not branding pangolin sightings as an activity through the lodge. So I think that's really important to distinguish. Um, We've made it that if a researcher is out, myself, for example, uh, following a pangolin for a particular reason, we are totally open to guests coming to join us and get involved. And through that, 
they've been able to make really great donations to our foundation where that money can go straight into the research. So that's been really, really helpful. But um, my biggest concern, and Chavez, you did touch on this a bit, but is the ethical side of things. Um, we do need to make sure that we are being ethical with this. So one of the biggest findings from my work over the past five years is that any disturbance to these animals, especially in winter, um, and maybe it's just particular to, to my species that I'm working with, which is the, the Temminx ground pangolin, and maybe it's just specific to the environment, but in winter they are so stressed and any, any little disturbance to their natural behavior can be so drastic. And so I think that's a huge point that we need to make sure um, we take care of when going through with this is to make sure that it's all ethical and that you, if you're viewing it, um, do it for a short amount of time, limit your time, do it from a distance, make sure you're doing what you can to make sure that animal is um, doing its natural behavior. And um, just one more thing I want to touch on just so I can give everybody else a chance is I think the the word pangolin ecotourism is a little bit of a slippery slope and this is just my opinion and you can all chip in there but um, I think we should maybe leave it to a broader term like ecotourism because I think naming it pangolin tourism raises an, expe uh, an expectation that you're almost guaranteeing a sighting so if you brand your lodge or whatever you're doing as an, a pangolin tourism site, um, people going there might then expect to see a pangolin and it should never be an expectation. It should never be a guarantee. Um, certainly where we are, we could never guarantee a pangolin sighting, even if they do have a tracking transfer on it. So that's my thoughts. Uh, the, when, so th thank you so much for your valuable input. A question, when, so how do you do your ethical management in the sense that uh, when you see a pangolin, do you keep a distance for how long? How, how, how far is your distance and um, do you see that are your pangolins diurnal are they nocturnal over there or yeah so so the species i'm working with is predominantly nocturnal um, so we do a lot of our viewing at night um, with a flashlight uh, when during the winter they do sometimes become diurnal so it's a huge opportunity for guests to see them during the day which obviously makes it then easier to view them from a distance um, it's really difficult to to put standards by saying okay let's only do it for 10 minutes and make sure you're standing about 50 meters or more whatever it it depends on the individual the problem is you can't always trust people to use their discretion because everybody's discretion is different their opinion of discretion is different so you really need to gauge it depending on the individual pangolin itself um i was chatting to rod earlier today saying you know each individual pangolin does have its own little personality and so some are really bold and you can wash them for hours on end. They're walking around doing their thing. You're not stopping them from doing anything. Others are super shy. And so you have to limit your, your exposure to them. And so what we've done is, is in terms of my project and, and wanting to get as much data as possible, um, a gradual habituation program, uh, kind of not program, but um, procedure where you just spend an hour with them every day until they become so accustomed to you that they're mm -hmm. doing whatever they want to do. But, but when it comes to tourists, um, and people coming from the outside, you, don't, you, you just want to minimize that impact as much yeah. as possible. So stand as far as you can. If you have a sighting, that's great. Yeah. Anybody who wants to see a pangolin is going to be grateful for any sighting they can get. And I've seen that over the past five years. So yeah, use your discretion, I guess. Yeah, perfect. This is Wendy. This is a very, uh, this is excellent. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, just before Rod, we go to you. Uh, Julian, uh, you're right. If people who have bad connection, you can uh, put your questions out. And again, people who just came in a bit new, uh, I gave a presentation earlier on regarding pangolin tourism on wild pangolin tourism, you know, through whether we can put transmitters on them or we can do night drives or morning drives, look for them. And there's some people who are already doing pangolin tourism or researchers. So we're just discussing right now. Again, if anybody has questions or comments or discussion or whatever, please raise your hand. And um, I think there is a button where you can raise your hand or finger and it comes on my um, under the participant so I can quickly see there. But right now, Rod, uh, you yes, like that. Yes, AK and Rod. Yes, that's, that's what I mean. Okay, Rod, you could go first, please. Thank you. Okay, I just want to chip in um, and... and go along with Wendy as obviously you can uh, Wendy and I chatted just before this uh, talk uh, and so did I chat with uh, Maya and Tessa. Um, we at the lodge uh, the program is run by Maya and 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 Tam and Tessa uh, we don't let anybody see pangolins um, we, we only have one pangolin uh, that is habituated it was hand raised and uh, we're very fortunate the black-bellied pangolin is the only diurnal pangolin so, so 
we have trackers that follow the pangolin and gather data all day and our researchers work with them that's tessa and maya who are, can chip in here if they want to please uh tessa and maya you're there somewhere please feel free to step in um the uh but like like wendy says you you've got to be very very careful with with the clients we have strict protocol we only allow three people in uh three tourists at a time um, and it has to uh, rely entirely on when the, the, the researchers say is a good time to go and, um, and the researchers control the, 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 the sighting at all times. It's not an open um, branded pangolin lodge. We, we don't try and sell it as that. It's, it's, a, it's a tourist lodge. Our biggest product are, are the elephants at Zangabai and, and, and gorilla tracking. Pangolins is a bonus for, for a few people. We have turned tourists away. We've found people who are just too obnoxious to go and see pangolins and you don't let them go. Uh, so, yes, I think it's, it's a good thing to be able to, to have a habituated pangolin that people can see. But, um, but they get disturbed really, really easily. And, and I don't think, I don't think you can, you can um, predict that. Um, the other, that's our black bellied pangolin. White bellied pangolins. We know we can find them if we do night walks, and, and we do that occasionally, but then also you don't want to disturb them too much. So it's a sighting. Now, does a sighting make it a pangolin tourism product? Because on that same night walk, you would have seen potter, palm civet, several species of galago, maybe a genet or two. You know, is it a pangolin night walk, or is it a genet night walk, or is it a potto night walk? It, it's a, it's general tourism there with the, with the uh, uh, casual sightings from time to time. That's what I have to say. Over. Um, Rod, thank you so much for your comments. Now we're going to wait if you, maybe your colleagues want to add on. By the way, Rod, how did you do this uh, hand feature so others can learn as well? How did you do that? Uh, that comes, you, you, you tick on the thing participants at the bottom. It brings up a participant list next to you. And then at the bottom of that, it says raise and lower hand. Okay, so, so a little bit of practice for this in the last okay. few weeks. If not, just go to your screen. There, in the reactions, there's a thumbs up, like on mine. If you want to talk, so I can see who's commenting. Okay, the next person is AK. I'll unmute you. You can share what you want to say. AK, you have raised your hand. Not anymore. Okay. okay. Uh, Wendy. Okay. So anybody else would like to say anything? Uh, Bao? Yeah. Okay. Bao first. Okay. Uh, Bao first and then Sandra and Claire. Okay. I'll write that down. Yes, Bao, please go. Yeah. <laughs> we are working in Maharashtra, India for last three years for Indian <coughs> pangolin. And, and uh, in last three years, we never seen the pangolin in wild. So this uh, idea of uh, pangolin tourism is very good. But thing is that when the uh, tourist pressure is so heavy, then all the <coughs> SOPs not perfectly <coughs> apply on the ground. That is the only thing. If we <coughs> apply all the SOPs and uh, related things perfectly then it is perfect but when there is a huge pressure of tourism then it not works perfectly that is the thing because uh, uh, in 2002 to uh, 2017 19 or uh, <coughs> this uh, 2000 we are working on marine turtles and there is a good uh, <coughs> tourism is there but many time it happens when the tourism pressure is very big then uh, problems occurs. That's the thing. We have to perfectly monitor all the things. Uh, Bao, thank you so much for your comment. Okay, uh, we will have Sandra first and then Claire. So, can you hear me? Hey, hey there. Um, I have a question. Um, it is 
what do you or how do you um, guarantee the safety uh, if you do pangolin tourism because um, if the poachers for example know that you have a lodge where you can um, where you see pangolins very often or if you can track the pangolins how does it work that there is not not, not something happening like it was in Tula Tula with the rhino orphan so that the poachers attack the people there is there anything you can say about that yeah, that's a very good point. I don't have the answer for that. Anybody wants like to say that on, on that? I mean, I know in Africa, the same thing, you know, in reserves, I went to this park called Pilansburg National Park. They do rhino and elephant tourism there. They have collared some of them as well for research purposes. And the threat is that the poachers come in by helicopters because they know yeah. this is a very good place to see rhinos and they shoot them. So it's quite uh, tough. To answer your question, Sandra, we have Benoit, and Matt, who wants to talk first? Benoit? Yes, uh, sorry. It's just, just to add something to, uh, to uh, uh, what uh, Sandra just said. Uh, it's actually a question. I mean, um, how do you guarantee when you're using uh, hunters uh, for tourism? How do you guarantee that, for example, during the crisis, like the current one with COVID-19, where you can't actually provide any, any work to that uh, hunter, how can you guarantee that that hunter is not going to go back to the forest and hunt pangolins to get a living? Very good question, Benoit. And anybody would like to say on to that? All I can say to that one is very true. If they are hungry, they'll go back to the forest, they'll hunt as well. But all I can say is another thing, due to this pandemic, of course, tourism industry has kind of collapsed at the moment, but due to this pandemic, the governments all over the world have no money right now, and they have, conservation is last of their priorities, so conservation in general is struggling, poaching is increasing everywhere, and I don't think, so I think it's a very complicated situation, but yeah, Benoit, it's a very good point. Anybody would like to say to that? Uh, I, I think we'll go with Claire first. Or not, not on that, okay. Would you like, uh, would you I like can to chip in if you want. Uh, Rod wants to say something first. I mean, who wants to answer Benoit first? Yeah, the question by uh, Benoit. Rod. I mean, our trackers are all Baaka people. They're they're um, they're they're all hunter gatherers. They they're not commercial hunters. They just hunt for a living. Um, Central Africa is different to 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 um, somewhere like uh, Tula Tula, where you've got a small game reserve that has got. Um, that's fenced and protects rhinos. If you, if you look at our at our area, we've it's it's many hundreds of square kilometers of rainforest that are full of elephants and pangolins and all sorts of other things as well. So so they're not going to say, oh, we've got to go to my lodge and 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 find pangolins because they've got pangolin tourism there. There must be lots of pangolins. We we don't know how many pangolins there are in the, uh, in the forest. We don't know what the density should be. Um, if, before, before there was any form of poaching, we, we just don't know. But, um, but I don't think they're going to single out the lodge. They're going to actually avoid the lodge because there's people there. They're going to go into to forest, vast areas of forest where there's no people to 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 continue their hunting thing. But our hunters, they are very simple people. They're not um, they're not sophisticated hunters. They're the most beautiful people in the world. They, they hunt in the purest sense of the word. They hunt for food. They don't hunt for anything else. Um, that's that's what I can say where we are. In in areas with high populations, I can't speak for those. I don't work there, luckily. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rod. Uh, we'll go with Claire first, Maria, and then Matt. Claire? Um, yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I guess uh, the conversation is a little bit moved towards um, uh, the, the whole guide and hunter conundrum. Um, I would say just very briefly on that, that I think that what COVID has really highlighted, and we knew this anyway, that tourism do, is very susceptible to shocks. And that can be from terrorism or it can be this pandemic. And conservation and wildlife protection relying solely on tourism does not have a huge amount of resilience. So we need to think quite widely about that, whether we're talking about species protection or area protection. Um, and Kenya's really facing that issue at the moment um, with this COVID-19 shock. Um, uh, we run a small research project down in the Masai Mara, and I just wanted to go back a little bit on the conversation around 
uh, research and tourism as a product um, or pangolin tourism as a product and just some of the complications that we found um, as a research project um, and kind of the lessons that we've learned I think touch on some of the conversations that being had before um, the first thing is that um, we ran a research project in an area that has some of the highest density of game of elephant and lion populations and as a result of that tracking pangolin um, and pangolin live um, really closely within these areas um, tracking pangolin has its own risk to it i know everyone has risks working in these areas where there's other wildlife it doesn't open up a huge amount of problems with tourists as well um, and as a result of that i think and this is one thing that i haven't heard said is that um, we absolutely categorically say it cannot involve vehicles and um, for the reasons that wendy says around um, around disturbance to pangolin and that can create quite a lot of issues um, and quite a lot of limitations to tourists and, and people joining us um, when we're doing some of our research and tracking. Um, the other thing with that then comes in obviously visibility and I know some of the people working in Southeast Asia and areas where it's um, um, close vegetation is that it makes therefore tracking and sightings very very difficult. Um, indeed, and we have a big problem with that as well. And then when you add in the nocturnal element of going out at night and the grass is up maybe around your waist and you have buffalo, elephant, lion in areas, it really um, is quite limiting. So there's quite a lot of like reality checks, I think, around tourism um, as kind of a component. Um, the other thing I would say is, and it depends how your research projects are set up, if you're doing this from research, um, we are working in collaboration with a tourism partner but it is hard to regulate, I think. There's quite a lot of pressure from tourism partners um, around kind of the expectation of what pangolin tourism can be. And I think that if you're working on a research component, that balance has to really be there. Um, and it has to be kind of closely respected. I don't know if anyone else has, has had similar challenges or similar issues. Um, and then the other thing is to say that because of these challenges that we found from, from kind of uh, the expectation of tourists coming and coming with us and tracking pangolin, is that we've started to kind of really phrase it more as a pangolin research experience that we've put together. So we have out um, 15 to 20 cameras, 15 to 20 burrows a day. Um, we, we track and we um, have camera traps outside um, burrows of uh, up to two pangolins at a time. So we have daily footage of pangolins. And what we've actually started to do, and we found that this is working. Claire, I think you have. And then they have. Uh, okay. Not, not sorry. Can hear you. Yeah. Can, not, can hear oh, you. sorry. Yeah. So sorry. We have tourists that come out with the team, and they um, join the team in collecting the camera trap footage. And the team goes through a whole thing about pangolin habitat, about um, where the pangolin are, and then the tourists then basically get to see all the camera trap footage and also the satellite tracking information from the night before. And so in that way, we've managed to manage expectations a lot, um, a lot in, a, in a lot more manageable way and also manage expectations. And I think it's really also added to the experience of information about pangolin um, rather than the focus just being on seeing a pangolin at that particular time. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some of our experiences that we found. Fine, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Claire. Uh, before we go on to the next few people, Elliot Frost has to say people may say that ecotourism is vulnerable and the situation we're all right now in is an example of this. However, the trade in commodities and stocks also face the same issues. Markets and industries all fluctuate depending on the supply and demand and so surely it is better to invest in protecting and conserving as opposed to continuing the degradation. An example of this is oil. This has been one of the most lucrative stocks of the century, yet there we are in a time of crisis that's completely collapsed. On our tra current trajectory, oil reserves will have run up within the century and so their value have to begin to dry up. However, wild species and rich biodiversity will continue to hold its value. So this is by Elliot. Uh, we'll go to Maria first. Maria Dick, Dicknam, Dickman, Dickman. Uh, Maria, can you hear us? Yeah, can, can you, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to um, hit a couple of points first. Somebody was talking about red light versus white light. 
Um, in our experience, red light definitely is preferable to white light. Um, we won't allow any white lights, no flashes, nothing like that. So, um, but we have a very different experience with penguins. Um, we don't go out at night. We don't allow our tourists to go out at night. Um, so we would never use a flashlight, but I understand some of you might need to. Um, about the issue of security, I think we're already in a very insecure situation with pangolins. So yes, if you're known as having pangolins or researching pangolins or having access to pangolins in the wild, you definitely need to start taking precautions if you're not already, um, because I think that it's going to be something, you know, where you are going to have to be able to protect yourself and your center, your staff and your, your animals. Um, but it's no really, no, it's not opening you up to any more trouble or it's not opening pangolins up to any more trouble, I believe, than what they're already experiencing. Um, Claire said a really interesting thing about, um, you know, never guaranteeing, I think uh, maybe one of the other women too. Um, we're in a situation where we are known for seeing our pangolin. Okay, we're also known for seeing our vultures and other raptors and things like that. But I, I suppose we, at the moment, are most known for our pangolin um, because I do have a couple of pangolins at the center that go out every day. We do walk them every single day. Um, with our researchers, so that opportunity is available, although we still never guarantee it. I mean, I've been able to do it for almost seven years, um, but we are very, very clear in all of our um, correspondence with people that that's never guaranteed. Um, and I think we need to start opening ourselves open uh, to, to a couple of really interesting ideas. One of the things we're looking at is um, 360. Um, so you take 360 footage of your animals and you do virtual reality and you get goggles on your tour, and they no longer have to walk with a pangolin. Um, they can have that entire experience. They can see things that they're never gonna be able to see in a five or a 10 minute or a 15 minute experience on the ground anyway. Um, and they can still <clears throat> feel like they've had it. Um, it takes all the pressure off of us as establishments and, and education centers and all the rest of it. You know, you don't wanna take a bunch of you know, 30 children out into the field um, and have them following wild penguins, or at least in our experience, we would want to. So that enables you to get some amazing footage that not only can be used for your own center, but for video and film productions and, and all sorts of things like that. So I think that's important to remember. And one, two things actually that I'd love to come out of this. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of it, but I don't want to waste time jumping in and out of here. So I'll say it all at once is I'm wondering if with such an amazing expertise altogether, if we can't work out some, some protocols, not things that you know, the world has to stick with and, and all the rest of it, but maybe some guidelines for some of our countries, for some of maybe our governments, um, because we've all got some, some experiences that I think could add to that. Um, and also, there was something else. Oh, trackers. Please guys, I'm desperate for trackers. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm, I'm hearing satellite images from Claire. Uh, you know, I've put satellite trackers on vultures. We were the first in Africa and I can't get a good tracker, anything other than VHF for a penguin. So if that can come out of today's or if somebody can private message me, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for the time and organizing this. Um, Maria, thank you so much for your comments. And I agree with the tracker bit. I, also, <laughs> I, I would be interested in that too. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the only thing I would like to say to that is, and I, and like how other people have raised their concerns about we can't just sell it as pangolin tourism, which is very true. It, I think it was this poster was made to get everyone's attention, but you're right. I think we cannot just sell it as pangolin tourism. Even there's some companies on Borneo, for example, they do clouded leopard tourism, but they cannot guarantee a clouded leopard. And, and most of these wildlife tourists who are coming, they know that. So they also see other wildlife as well. But the point is the money is being pumped in in the economy, local people are being hired and it's a great thing. But no, we have to be very careful in that. And thank you, Maria, for that. Uh, the next person is Matt. Matt, could you unmute yourself perhaps? Yeah, thanks Chavez and hi everybody. Um, so there's a couple of things that I, I see as falling out is very, very interesting in this conversation. Uh, the first is that um, everybody's remarks seems to really highlight and underscore the fact that even though we all refer to these things as pangolins and, and do very kind of group and lump statements and conversations, there is a shocking amount of ecological and behavioral diversity amongst the eight species. And I think a lot of the statements that people are making, whether it's, you know, SOPs for following animals and protocol and, and tourism research, or the threats uh, from poaching and all of a sudden 
publicly alerting, you know, people to the, the presence of penguins at your site are going to vary so much from species to species and context to context, you know, where the, the poaching strategies and, and the drivers in Southern Africa and East Africa are substantially different than, you know, what Rod was highlighting in Central Africa, for example, which are substantially different again from what we experience in West Africa, where, you know, people know where penguins are. The, the strategy for amassing penguins is, is through kind of individual hunting events uh, just accumulated over time to, to kind of uh, mass up tons and tons of scales, that sort of stuff. And so you know, the threats are gonna be different. And the other thing that, that kind of falls out to me that I think we need to spend a little bit more time talking about, whether you know, for penguin tourism and even for research for that matter, is um, there seems to be a lot of statements being made about the impact of penguins and penguins are very the impact on penguins. Penguins are very sensitive to this and penguins are very sensitive to that. But it seems like we have a real deficit of actual scientific data supporting a lot of those observations. You know, no one's really done, at least that I've read, not many scientific studies on on, you know, let's say stress hormone reactions to encounters with people and, you know, you know, uh, with black-bellied penguins and you see them sometimes and they remain frozen for hours and hours at a time until they're sure the threats have passed. I mean, do they literally just get up and kind of carry on with their lives afterwards? And have we actually disturbed them any more than say, you know, a predator, a chimpanzee or a, you know, a, a big raptor or whatever would have as well. Um, and so, you know, this is not, this is not to advocate that we kind of go forward on a, on a Yahoo approach and do things all willy nilly. It's just to say that I think we do, at some point in time, need to recognize the species diversity we're talking about. I think we need to recognize the environmental and social context, context diversity that we're talking about. And I think this is actually a, probably a very good platform from which some of us can go forward and start to gather data on some of these questions that might be able to define SOPs in a, in a much more you know, um, um, objective and rigorous way. Matt, thank you so much for your um, insight and your comments, your feedback. It's re really interesting and thank you so much for that. Um, we'll go to Ellen first and then we'll go to Wendy and then Maria again. So Ellen, could you unmute yourself? Hi all. Um, yeah, thank you for this um, incredible platform, Chavez. It's giving us all an opportunity to have our proverbial five cents worth and yeah a nice uh, controlled informal platform thank you um for those of you who don't know my name is ellen and i'm from the tiki highwood foundation in zimbabwe and um to give you a bit of background well i'm going to try and keep it very short um we're on pangolin number 220 that is temnix ground pangolins and that is the rescued number of animals since january 2012. So I can comfortably say that we've had a fair bit of experience with this species. I'm going to echo a lot of what Wendy said. They are quite sensitive. Um, we don't conduct any form of tourism whatsoever. We're not even open to the public as an entity. We do rescue and rehabilitate other species, but we are not open to the public. And to be quite honest, my, my frank opinion on the subject right now is that I'm scared we don't know enough about pangolins yet in order to make these informed decisions. So definitely echoing a lot of what Matt is saying, there's a lot of lack in the scientific arena, but we're running out of time and it's like a double-edged sword because on the one hand, you have to generate funds to do the work and you also have to educate people. But on the other hand, you've got an animal that's super sensitive um, we haven't even touched on the subject of zoonosis yet, and I know that's probably worth another meeting altogether. And I just feel that, um, yeah, I, I totally agree that protocols need to be designed, but they're going to have to come from the people who are experts in those species. And that in itself, I think, is going to be quite a big task. So for me, for Zimbabwe right now, the kind of tourism I'd rather promote is the more broad spectrum tourism. The park that we work in is home to the big five. There is no ways in hell I will take any tourists into the park to see pangolins with me because I will be sued. They'll be, the, things will happen to them and I will be sued. So that certainly is not an option for us. I'm not saying that um, that needs to apply across the board. I understand that there are different circumstances for everyone, but certainly for ground pangolin, for myself and for where we are in Zimbabwe, it's not really an option. However, the, the 3D, um, the 360 stuff that Maria was talking about, and certainly, um, Claire, the, the kind of stuff you're doing in Kenya sounds groundbreaking. I think that's really fantastic. 
And I think as pangolin orientated people, we've got to explore all these avenues and do the best that we can for the species. Um, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, uh, thank you for your uh, comments and your perspective from Africa and Zimbabwe. But you know, I, I have a question. You know, I mean, your foundation, for example, where does your money source come from? I'm not being not being a busybody, no, but no, just no, asking no, sure, because uh, because some some organizations might want to do this uh, concept of you know uh, pangolin tourism in the sense to fund their projects. You know, not everybody gets donations and so on, and they want to be sustainable and hire people. So. Um, I just want to know. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Look, um, we come, we, we one of the longest standing, um, I can say this comfortably, pangolin orientated groups, I would say definitely in Southern Africa. We, we were started in 1994 and our founder, Lisa Highwood, actually got her first pangolin in 1992. So we've been going for a while um, on the subject and yes, it is difficult. Uh, most of our work is grant driven. Um, however, we are fortunate to have a select few, I can call them private donors, who have been following us for years and support our work. Um, so yeah, predominantly that's how we generate our income. You might all have a bit of a giggle at this one as well, but Lisa Highwood um, inherited a lot of antiques from her parents and uh, that is what has sustained our work. Um, I know that that's not an ideal scenario for everyone, but you do what you've got to do. And that's why I said, you know, I agree that this might be an avenue for some folks, but it really, really has to be regulated and managed extremely closely. Thank you so much, Ellen, for this. Uh, we'll go to Wendy first, and then we're going to go back to Maria, Prativa, and Benoit. So, uh, Wendy? Right, thanks, guys. Um, I've got a, a few points here. Um, first, Ellen, I uh, totally agree with what you said as well. Um, in terms of what we have found works more than some other things. So, so there have been a few instances, I'm, I won't name names or organizations, but where an activity was pretty much guaranteed. So you pay ahead of time for a pangolin experience and that helps sustain the project. The problem is if you were paying, say for a tracking transmitter change and you arrived as a guest and that pangolin didn't need a tracking transmitter change, what do you do? You know, you as a researcher or an organization shouldn't be going to change a tracking transmitter just for the sake that it's generating an income. So what we find works better is doing it on an ad hoc basis. So um, if you find that you do have a pangolin that needs a tracking transmitter change or whatever the case is, um, you go to the lodge or whatever's, whatever the situation is that you're in, I think we all need to realize that this is going to be situation dependent, which I think we all know. Um, so you go to the lodge, for example, say we have this opportunity, it's amazing, you can come and help us change a transmitter or help us collect data. It's going to cost this first come first serve or, you know, whatever the case may be. I think that's um, a way to alleviate that, that pressure that it puts on researchers or organizations. And then in terms of something that Matt said, um, in terms of the data being lacking for evidence that um, people presence is causing an issue for pangolins, um, some of my work that's actually really cool is not directly showing that people being present has, has an influence on pangolins, but we have been able to measure the body temperature patterns of pangolins for two consecutive years. And that is just showing how stressed these animals, again, guys, I'm working with one particular population, one species in one area, so it might be very different elsewhere, but we are showing in um, in circun cer certain circumstances, especially when pangolins don't have access to food, the, the body temperature patterns are crazy. And it's just, it's not healthy for a pangolin to be experiencing that kind of thing, especially when they're becoming diurnal in the winter or whatever. And so I think um, the same can be applied to tourism presence is if an animal is not feeding, you are directly causing a problem in that animal's welfare. And so we try and minimize that from that perspective. But I'm still busy writing the PhD and the papers. I'm not the best writer, so guys, please be patient. It will come out soon, but I will have a whole management implication side as well as a guideline side. And um, just by the way, someone else brought that up as well in terms of guidelines, um, uh, a section on guidelines, but again, for that particular species in that particular environment. Um, so hopefully that will help. And then one more point was that um, someone brought up the idea, I think it was Maria um, of VR. This is a great idea, I think, and I have first-hand experience with that. We had a team called Habitat X, if anybody's interested, who came and did a beautiful film on pangolins using that 360 VR footage, and it's just, it's unbelievable what you can experience 
just you put these this headset on and, and it's like you have that pangolin right in front of you and so that in itself can generate a lot of ecotourism without you having to interrupt the animal itself um, on the ground um, okay i'm gonna <laughs> leave it there Thank you, Wendy, so much for your, again, information. And um, do share that VR video, perhaps, and somebody asks when your pub, uh, paper will be published. And yeah, again, it's very uh, good perspective on that one particular species, you know, may not be applying to other species which are more tropical or, you know, so on. But no, it's still very, uh, very relevant and so on. And yeah, I think most wildlife companies or mammal watchers, if you do, they do sell a product of anywhere, whether it's a snow leopard trip or a gorilla trip, you, you should not guarantee and it should not be just around there. They should know that, you're, you know, if you don't see it and, and we have to be careful. And I think all these rules and regulations have to be enforced and told to the visitor in advance. But thank you, Wendy. And yeah, do share when your paper is out and your video as well. I think the next person will be Mar Maria and then Prativa. Maria, could you? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? I just wanted to say something in regards to Matt's comment. Um, we have been doing some research, or we research with the Johannesburg Veterinarian Zoo. We've also done some stuff with, with um, Tiki uh, Highwood. Um, and we are starting to find some very interesting things. And this is not a published paper, but I just want to throw some stuff out there. Is that with the Temex, and again, I only talk about the Temex. It's the only one I can talk about um, realistically. Um, it has a huge impact. Uh, you're hearing it from other people, um, but we're starting to get data on it. Um, new procedures are when a pangolin comes in, it must be held for seven days. It goes against everything we always believed, but I promise you it makes all the difference in the world. The pangolins that we're releasing once we started putting trackers on them, you know, everyone patted themselves on the back for years and said, yay, I released another pangolin in the wild. We found that 80% of those pangolins, once we were putting trackers on them, were dying within the first six to eight weeks. Okay, we believe it's due to the stress levels going up. We're not 100% sure exactly what, but now we bring a pangolin in, you've got to take blood. You've got to be scientific. We can't do this thumb guessing anymore. We take blood, we look at a number of different levels. We're very, very scientific about it now. And within seven days, almost every pangolin we've been able to release. And we've been able to change that from an 80% decline or, or mortality to an 80% success rate. Um, and from that, we've now in the, this year, the last six that we've released, we've had 100% success rate so far. And that was during one of the worst droughts in recorded history in our country. So definitely, I think with wild ones, we have to be incredibly careful. I'll stand back. I, I know some people in Namibia. I know, well, sorry, I know one person in Namibia. He's not on this chat group that's been incredibly successful um, doing tourism and wild ones, but it's incredibly limited and he's probably harder on himself than any of us can ever be um, with his interactions and things. But I also know of another couple of organizations that are wanting to get into the tourism aspect for financial reasons um, and could be pushing those boundaries um, a little bit rough for our pangolins. Um, the second point I wanna make, and again, I'm only really talking about Temex, but just an inkling that I got is that tree pangolins are so much more adaptable. They, they're just more adaptable to everything. Um, when I had this chance, I don't know if anyone is here from Save Vietnam's Wildlife, but when I had a chance to visit them a couple of years ago, we had a pangolin come in with, with, with a leg missing. And that pangolin had been traveling in a bus, I think for three days. Um, they gave him food and he started eating. I can promise you that Cape pangolin would have been dead within 12 hours um, and he certainly wouldn't have eaten food within the first seven days. Um, so I think your tree pangolins, you know, there's this quite controversial, if I may make it that way, you know, importation of, of tree pangolins from Africa over to the United States. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on exactly how well that's gone, gone but I, I, I suspect it's gone better than if they'd taken ground pangolin or Temex pangolin or Cape pangolin. So I think, you know, the, some of the people that you're hearing about from Southern Africa um, were really, really call foot. We're really, really careful with our pangolins because I think they are probably the most sensitive. Um, usually anything that can handle arid conditions is more sensitive than those species that can't. Um, so I think you guys, you know, over in Asia, in, in North Africa, Central Africa, even are probably dealing with, with situations not quite as, as detrimental to the pangolins as ours. And I think we in Southern Africa have to be open to that. Thank you, Maria. That is a very good comparison there you have done as well in your input. Thank you so much for your uh, insight. Uh, we'll go with Prativa next. Yeah, 
Yes. Namaste, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm just, I'm from Nepal and I wor I'm working in Pangolin since many years ago. And uh, in Nepal, uh, we, we do not have much poaching uh, like, the, like the issues are raised in their countries. And uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and basically I'm involved, um, me and my team, we are involved with this community-based conservation approaches in Nepal uh, because our national survey, pangolin survey has shown most of the pangolin, they are in, they are outside the protected area of the country. And uh, in the high mountains or in the low, low land area of Nepal, uh, we promoted community-based conservation of uh, pangolins. And for that, uh, as it is community-based, uh, um, the people, they want to have some employment or they want to have some involvement uh, that can raise some economy to their livelihood. So we, we just tried, uh, we just planned and tried, we are just trying uh, to take our research and giving training to people and also teaching them that uh, ecotourism, pangolin-based ecotourism, maybe be a good uh, potential um, option for the livelihood upliftment. But for that, as we uh, do care with pangolins, they are very super sensitive. So uh, what we have tried is we, uh, we trained ecotourism as an important package, but, but uh, besides uh, directing to the pangolin, we also blend with other natural scenarios or we don't have, we don't have set like pangolin-based ecotourism. We have said ecotourism, but uh, there is a possibility of pangolin uh, just roaming around the jungle. We don't have some, that sort of uh, te technology here in Nepal. So uh, basically, we, uh, uh, we have just um, trained the local people, identifying the boroughs, identifying the resting and the active boroughs, its footprints like that. Uh, till yet, uh, we haven't tried um, regionally or nationally, but as a local scale, we, we tried a bit, but uh, um, uh, but we uh, we also think that there must be a good protocol um, before we uh, take the things into the ground. Uh, and also another case is uh, um, uh, I do agree with the other I do agree with the other people. Uh, we have a try we have a camera trap the species um, and we have found the species in the wild, but um, uh, in, our, in my opinion, this pangolin uh, tourism can be an um, option for Nepal because we don't have that much posing in, the, in this country. And also, uh, uh, I hope there are, some, there are many areas uh, with pangolins in Nepal. But however, we do lack some basic research on pangolin, so it might be disastrous if uh, if we do not follow any protocols and uh, but um, i'm enjoying i am listening to all of the um, our participants and their valuable comments and their feedbacks so we, we can also have some insight on that and actually i'm also uh, enjoying this uh, discussion and i would like to thank you uh, for this uh, discussion program uh, okay. you, you, th thank you so much, pra thank you so much, Prativa from Nepal, from giving your for for, for giving your uh, experience and your concerns and your feedback. Thank you so much, um, Benoit. You raised your hand earlier on. Do you have something to say? No, no more. Okay, he's taken down. Uh, next one is Sean. Actually, on my list. Sean, do you still have something to say? I think Sean is not around at the moment. So we'll go to the next one, Matt. Matt Can you hear me, sir? Sorry, we'll go to Sean first. Sean is there. Sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, I pressed the wrong button. Um, just a quick thing I wanted to ask, uh, and it's sort of, sort of relating to what Ellen said, Wendy said, uh, Maria also spoke about it, and recently Prativa, is without these sort of ideas of what's the best standard operating uh, procedures, what's the impact if, um, other reserves or other uh, people that want to make money out of this uh, start to to utilize this sort of idea as a as a as a as a way to basically make money. What's the impact that will have um, on the pangolin conservation? Uh, that's just my sort of input and any suggestions.
Sorry, sorry, can you just repeat that question? Sure, sorry. So um, with these sort of, uh, uh, I, I see there's a lot of uh, important conservation programs and researchers working on, on, on pangolin tracking and maybe utilizing it as a way for tourism. But my question is, if you have people that are less interested in uh, looking after pangolins or um, utilizing it for the correct uh, means, uh, without these standard operating procedures, what's that impact on, 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 on pangolin conservation going to be? Uh, Sean, I, I'm just going to give you my opinion on that one. I think that is the problem we, I think we have discussed. I think if pangolin tourism is done right through proper SOPs, and through proper, let's say, min, uh, managed participants. I think it's a great idea. It's helping the economy, hiring local people. But of course, if it's not done right, then it's problematic. And I think that's my opinion. If anybody wants to say, just raise your hand and we'll still go on the order. Um, uh, the next one is Matt. Thanks, Chavez. Uh, Maria and Maya and Ellen and, and all of you guys, Wendy, that largely work with rehab pangolins. I mean, this, this question is kind of for you, but I think it's a general observation. I think a lot of what we know about um, pangolins and their kind of response to interactions with humans is thanks to the good work that, that you guys are doing with rehab, rescue, seizure pangolins, which are oftentimes exposed to a significant level of stress prior to even coming into your programs and you know they've been captured they've been manhandled you know they have not been you know, t you know handled delicately the same way we would if we were doing it for capture for research you know they've been stuck in the the boot of a car in a, a wheel hub for days dehydrated um etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm wondering how much do we think that those observations and their reactions to further interactions with people actually apply to let's say the research pangolins that have only been uh, touched a single time and then had you know less less quote unquote stressful interactions because we're not out there to kill them or to wild pangolins in general you know just an animal out there foraging that we happen to come across who gets a light shined in his face for a few minutes to a couple hours whatever it happens to be and I'm I'm wondering if we're risking confounding the 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 two the two populations let's say and, and i i do agree with you that pangolins are sensitive and the evidence is overwhelming from seized pangolins and rescue pangolins that there is a high probability they're gonna they're gonna die they don't respond well to captivity like all those sorts of things but if we're talking about tourism on wild pangolins what are the crossover messages really thank you matt for your um question and comment uh we'll go to the next person elliot frost Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Elliot. Hi, um, great points from everyone so far, but on a slightly different note. Um, so we're all aware that pangolins are heavily trafficked due to the value they command in the illicit wildlife trade. Um, and conservation is an issue that governments tend to ignore when it comes to business economy. Uh, and so in my opinion, if you're to get their attention, there must be a value attached to it obviously a lot of us as um, researchers or scientists or just wildlife enthusiasts I suppose um, we don't see it like that but I, I think it's very different from their perspective sometimes um, and so ecosystem services and ecotourism provide exactly that we've slightly touched on it earlier but um, I read a study that estimates that protected nature areas around the world receive 8 billion visits per year um, and that equates to more than one visit per person for everyone on the whole planet so um, and this figure is supposedly on the the conservative side of the estimate um, and apparently that equates to an annual value um, put on protected areas of upwards of 600 billion dollars and yet less than 10 billion dollars is spent annually on protecting and managing these areas Thank you. Hello? Thank you. Yes, 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 Elliot. You can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear oh, okay. you. Okay, I thought the signal went a bit funny. No, no, you um, can so I was just wondering. I was just wondering what people's opinions are on, on, on this matter. Um, because obviously the true value of um, the wildlife isn't being reciprocated with the spending of the governments in their protection. Um, so maybe ecotourism could provide this boost to their value 
um, which would help us save the species. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. And, you know, in some countries, I think around the world are already using ecotourism as, you know, an important part of their GDP, for example, Costa Rica, you know, and a few other countries out there. Uh, if anybody wants to answer that, you can continue after this. We'll go to Stuart first, Ronald Pablo Stewart. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm on my partner's PC, so that's why it says Ronald. I'm Stuart. I'm a board member for Save Vietnam's Wildlife, and our approach has been slightly different. We've um, uh, had a great many pangolin rescues and releases, several hundred now, um, and we're touching on some slightly different things here in that um, uh, paid researchers, paid research assistants, and paid volunteers. Um, we, uh, in the National Park at Cook Fong, our paid volunteers are going to get an experience with our rescue pangolins because we have so many. If they're fortunate, and some of them have been, they've been there and been able to participate in pangolin releases, which is very labor intensive for us. It can involve a lot of animals. Um, but again, the expectation is not that they will always see wild pangolins. They most certainly won't. But part of their time spent with us as a paid volunteer or researcher is that they do have the opportunity to have night tours in the forest. It's a national park. Um, and the funding that we've got from those paid positions has been critical to us. But what it has done is the people that have done that have become wonderful ambassadors and fundraisers for us ongoing. Unmute yourself, Chavez. Unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, th I thought I had unmuted myself. Uh, sorry, Stu, do you have anything else to say or that's all? No, I'd finished. It was just um, we've had a different approach to raising money. They, they are ecotourists because they're traveling to work with our pangolins, but it's for a very specific purpose in a very specific way. Um, I mean, um, paid researchers as a way of fundraising has been around for a long time for a, a, a range of projects. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ronald, for sharing your experience in Vietnam. I'm Stuart. Sorry. Uh, this is four times, I think. Sorry. Sorry, Stuart. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for your uh, experience in Vietnam. We'll go to, we'll go to Marja next. Marja. Marja. Yes, hello everyone. So I'm working with uh, Rod and Tessa. Uh, yes, I just wanted to address the point in terms again on the stress level uh, when um, uh, observing pangolins and uh, especially on Maria and Matt's comments. Um, I think we need to be very careful um, also if we talk about tree pangolins. We know that they, it's all different contexts and all different um, yeah, species, of course. We talked about that. But uh, we have been like now through almost a hundred um, black and white bell bellied pangolins that we released. And there is a really huge uh, individual, uh, but each individual is different. Also, we do not have obviously um, uh, post monitoring release data, so we cannot say, but I think we need to be very careful. We see animals like even now that um, pangolins that we monitor daily, that we have observed over the years that they react uh, differently even over the time that they hide, that they stop eating, um, that they even, um, for a big point also to address I think is that uh, we have two, we had two females um, and they have never um, found a, a mate at that point so we are impacting hugely uh, in, in that well also in long term and even if we can call that like hand raise and um, uh, yes uh, in, a, in a way like habituated to humans and I want to just say that um, I don't think that they they would be less stressful they 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 do um, they they open themselves after a few days but it depends to towards the take the caretaker but they 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 respond very individually and unfortunately we do not have especially for the black-bellied pangolin any uh, method like a monitoring or tracking method 
at, uh, at that point. So I think there's a lot to, to discover, but uh, I think we need to be careful in, in addressing that the tree pangolins may be less <laughs> or more easily to, um, uh, to uh, yeah, habituate. Well, that was my point. Thank you. Thank you, Maja, for your input. I will go to Emilia. Hello. Um, I was just wondering whether certain pangolin species lend themselves to tourism more than others. As like Muriel was saying, that the, maybe the African pangolins are more, slightly more sensitive to the Asian pangolins and therefore the Asian pangolins could be a subject to this tourism without it being as much as a threat as the welfare may not be as much in danger of threat, yeah. That does it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. Uh, next one is Hong. Uh, actually, it was Wendy. Wendy, did you just raise you? Did you raise your hand earlier on? Do you still have okay. Uh, okay, we'll go with Hong Ying Li. Yeah. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm Hong Ying. I'm from. I work for Eco Health Alliance. We have been doing like wildlife zoonotic disease surveillance, but we work in China and my colleague Jimmy is here from Malaysia. Um, first of all, I want to say, um, I kind of envy you guys because you're already thinking about the tourism for pangolin because according to my experience working with Chinese pangolin in China, tourism is not an option at all now in China. But this raises another question, which is when we should be considering developing this tourism for pangolin, like what evidence we can base? For example, like the population, population density, like how many pangolin we should have in a, a nature reserve so that we can start thinking about having this tourism thing. So I just want to, and also like, um, I don't know other country, but in China, all the natural reserve is belong to the government. When we do the tourism, we have to work with the government. How can we make sure those money go to the volunteers, the hunters, and uh, the permit thing? Um, I'm not aware of any ecotourism permit in China currently, but you know, um, but now if this message is out, Okay, it sounds very encouraging for either financial reason or conservation reason. So a lot of people will try to uh, attempt to develop in this tourism thing. So I just want to say we should be more careful to set up some sort of criteria um, for people to think about this. Over. Thank you, Hong Ying. Over. Uh, I like that. Um, no, that is very, um, very interesting and good perspective from China. And I, um, yeah, thank you for that. Would anybody like to either reply to that or continue? Anybody else else has anything else to discuss? Yes, Tessa. Unmute. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to uh, say a little bit more about, um, provide some more anecdotes about our experience, which, I mean, from this discussion alone, it's clear that there are, you know, it's context specific. We're dealing with eight species, each different and each a little known, actually, in terms of their responses. And so because we've been used as an example for the potential for tourism, uh, I think it's important that we are, um, explicit that we don't have any intention of continuing this. I mean, we have a uh, Koki, the black belly pangolin who we are monitoring every day. And we're fortunate to have Baka trackers who are committed to the project. This is their livelihood. They're not gonna do anything to jeopardize that. Uh, once we are no longer monitoring Koki, we have no intention of replacing her with another pangolin in order to continue that as, a, as an activity offered to uh, clients. You know, this is incidental. We have some really specific um, conditions that allow for this. And as Maya has mentioned, you know, we are uh, already as a team having these con conversations internally. We're very critical about our methods. And I think we do a pretty good job of it. 
we do have to keep in mind that, you know, as Maya mentioned, uh, these two of the females have not copulated, they have not reproduced. That could be um, very well be a, a, a product or a consequence of our monitoring her every day. So with all of this in mind, you know, we, we do this ethically and responsibly to our best standards, and, but we have no intention or ex expectation that this be replicated in other countries or other regions. But I think this is a, the beginning of a con conservation that really needs to happen because people might be doing this um, informally uh, to the best of their own judgment, but if there is a protocol put in place, which I think we're far away from, then it needs to weigh in on all of the points that have been addressed today. So I'm happy that it's starting here at least. Thanks. Yes, that, that's why Tessa, I am also recording this. So if you know, this, this, this discussion could be, has so many interesting points which could be put in a proper uh, SOP guideline and so on. So this is why this is very interesting to have today's discussion. Anybody else would like to say anything? Any comments, any questions further? I think... Chavez, sorry, if you... <laughs> yes, Rod. Chavez, I'd be interested if you ran that poll a second time and you could see if people have changed their minds after the end of this conversation. <laughs> yes, Rod, that is the plan. That is the last... The last la <laughs> But I, I, I will do that uh, when we're just about to finish, which could be soon. So I just want to see if anybody else has anything wants to say. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to individual organizations or individual properties, whatever it is that you need to do. But I think what's important is that we don't make it such a global thing that we compromise someone else's um, objectives. So I think it's really good that we are having these discussions so each of us know where everybody else stands and and what the thoughts are and what the plans are and so i think we should continue this discussion um in the future and just keep talking about it i think it's great so thank you Shavis. yeah you're welcome wendy and of course if anybody wants to stay in touch with anybody please just put your emails and you know you can stay in touch or direct message anybody or um yeah get in touch with email later on social media but yeah again uh anybody else would like to say anything Actually, yes, I, I just have one last comment or question. And sorry, I can wait after Benoit. I saw him raising his okay. hand, being very polite. Okay. <laughs> sorry, Benoit, you can go first. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to ask about this idea of, of tagging of tagging a pangolin for tourism. This is, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm a bit confused because this is something you presented in your presentation. And, uh, and uh, if this is something that you're thinking about, uh, this is something that we really need to be discussed uh obviously in Saba uh you know with the Saba Wala department with all the NGOs working on conservation but it, it is a bit worrying uh especially following all your comments from from our friends from Africa especially um and uh, knowing about the, the Sunda pangolin how fragile they are and uh you know so I would yeah this is something that uh, needs to be discussed I think more uh, more deeply yes of course benoit this topic has to be discussed more deeply you know especially if it was being happening in Sabah or borneo uh, you know then of course all the relevant agencies will have to come back on the table but based on my presentation the idea was is that a possible way to put transmitters on pangolins and track them because you know it can create jobs it can pump money in the local economy it can change perceptions of local people it can educate people so it is so you know and like i said if researchers are doing it for research purposes we could do it for tourism purposes but of course that's the point of this today's discussion is it viable is it happening already what are people's concerns that's why everybody has given their own feedback of their own projects everywhere and you know that's what we have written down so we just this is just a discussion uh Time. No, I agree, and that's why I'm asking and posing the question. But I mean, you showed a picture of, of, uh, of actually a, a tagged pangolin and someone tracking it. So I was wondering whether, you know, well, you did it. Uh, it seems that you did it uh, already. And did you have a permit from the wildlife department, from SABC, etc.? I mean, from the Sabah Biodiversity Center. So I think this, this really needs to be discussed before these things are started. 
with proper SLP. Yes, of course. Uh, the thing is, you're talking about Saba example. Of course, we need yeah, yeah. Uh, we need we need uh, uh, permission and everything. First of all, uh, that would be illegal if it was happening in Saba without permits. Like as we chatted, that particular pangolin which was tracked and tagged by us was not in Saba. Just to answer your question. So, however, when it will be done in Saba, it will be done in a proper way, and this is why we have today's discussion, and this is why uh, we have a great time today with uh, different people's opinions. Okay, we'll go to Matt and then Maria. Benoit, thank you so much for your uh, uh, feedback there. Yeah, uh, we'll go to Matt first and then Maria. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just I think that the poll, uh, if you when you throw up the poll at the end, it shouldn't just be you know can tourism be a factor influencing the conservation or helping conserve penguins. But you know I think that the the the, sh the striking diversity of input we got from this group, ranging from yes, penguins have some hardiness to penguins are you know timings are very sensitive to you know rod is shutting down tourism or has no intention or doesn't do tourism and won't hear it in the future, and then Wendy kind of does tourism already and like that sort of stuff. I think that one thing that might be interesting is uh, to get a temperature from this, a temperature reading from this group about whether this is something we should be striving for, which might actually help guide, you know, future research, future interventions, and the tracking of response of pangolins so that we might be able to be in a position, a better position in the future than we are now, to guide SOPs, uh, development of legal procedures, working with governments to set up, you know, permitting and, and, and administrative policies, etc. Or if this is something that you know as a kind of a collective pangolin stakeholder group or you know a body of interest we feel isn't actually a worthwhile venture in which case it, it would push us in an entirely different trajectory moving forward thank you matt matt um maybe if you can uh, my right so could you type your question and i'll try to put that in the poll and of course this is uh, yeah, yeah so that will be one way so i'll try to do two different type of polls thank you matt for that we'll go to maria um, Benoit, I just wanted to say something to you or to anyone that has the same concerns, because I think I tend to be quite conservative, maybe like you are with, with pangolins. Um, and I'm seeing that as long as the tourism is associated with a conservation project, um, I think that is making all the difference in the world to, to, to how well that's actually handled. Um, and there was something I wanted to say about Matt's, but I can't remember, so it must not have been that important. I'll private message you later, Matt. Um, anybody else would like to go next? Uh, just unmute yourself if you want to go next, because I'm going to try to do this poll thing. Just unmute yourself, please, and thank you. If anybody wants to say anything, just unmute yourself, please. Okay. Uh, yes, anybody else would like to go? I'm still just trying to figure this out. I think, Matt, I'm struggling a little bit by because I'm still new to this Zoom thing. <laughs> Anybody would like to share more of their particular projects and uh, uh, on you know on their anything with their project or any other thing? Oh, Stuart, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I just I wanted I was curious. As I say, we've built into our project in Vietnam paid volunteering and. Uh, paid research assistants. Uh, d does anybody else do this with any of their pangolin projects as a way to raise funds? If anybody wants to answer that, just unmute yourself, please. We, we've we never had paid volunteers. We've got volunteers as such, but not paid volunteers. Tessa is the volunteer. Um, she doesn't get paid. Although we no, should but, pay but her. <laughs> she works hard she, enough, we should really pay her. No, I, I don't mean the project's paying them. They pay us to come. 
Oh yes, I know that. I know that. Um, and we run a tourist lodge, and I don't want to deal with uh, with 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 fifteen uh, graduate students, young young graduate students, or pre pre university students in my lodge. Thanks. No, I, I like I like mature students who at least. Got well, I think in in our experience, in our experience, our our volunteers have been very responsible, but they're very well briefed before they come. Yeah. Yeah, I know, and I think Kukfang is in a different environment and there's a bit of more social life and a bit more opportunities for, for, for students out there. Um, I, I've been to Kukfang um, and it, it's a great place, but um, it's, it's quite a lot different to us. Where we are, it's very, very remote. Uh, the nearest th- village is 10 kilometers away and uh, yeah, it's... I think and certainly what's that, come out nice. of this is we're all dealing with very different situations. Exactly, yeah. Okay, I, I would like go. to just... Oh, sorry, Rod. No, go. go. Uh, I, I, this hasn't been a brought up and it's not exactly the point of the conversation, but just out of a uh, point of interest, all of the unprecedented discussion around pangolins as of late, obviously, because due to the pandemic, it would be interesting to see coming out of this, um, whether there will be a, an increase in demand from tourists visiting countries, pangolin range countries that want to see uh, pangolins in the wild. And if that is something that organizations will have to individually respond to, um, and I guess uh, I'm just curious to see if that's that's going to happen in the coming months once tourism operations open up. And also, sorry, one thing, Matt, you're asking two really interesting questions. And I wonder if in the chat box and I wonder if maybe this can be put forward in the email uh, listserv around this event that people can respond to in um, in their own time. I think the idea was also for Chavez to do them as part of the poll at the end of the session. Yes, yes, I'm, uh, I'm almost there, I think. Uh, let me see, how is it working? I think I'm almost there. Oh, yes. No. Uh, it should pop up now in a second. Not really. Mm, I tried my best. I'll try one more time. Ah, ah, okay, okay, come. Okay, before we finish, before I do the poll, before I do the poll, I just want to say um, thank you again, everybody, for making time to come today. You know, again, people from all, you know, all over the world, from Africa, from Europe, from the States, from Malaysia, Southeast Asia, you know, and uh, everywhere, and India and Nepal, I just want to say thank you so much again for your invaluable feedback, input, your suggestions, your experiences, everything, all right? And I will record, I have recorded it, I think so, yeah, I have recorded it. <laughs> if anybody wants a copy, uh, just tell me later or I might put it on YouTube later. Um, I just want to summarize some of the things which I remember. When, if, and when dealing with pangolin tourism, we need to have uh, controlled participants, we, it's a very niche industry. Um, you cannot just use the word pangolin tourism. Uh, it's good because you pay off the expenses and um, what about research? Oh yeah, but there's also suggestion as we are virtual reality tourism, where you can do like a 360 degree um, viewing of the uh, area. Uh, each species is different. You know, it, uh, it, whatever the experience is on the black belly, it is not the same on the Philippine or the Sunda. Um, however, it also has been highlighted the scientific data is not sufficient yet on how stress, stressful tourism can be. Is it as much as a predator disturbing one, a pangolin, or is it, you know, really bad? Um, uh, Yes, and then also that how it is, it can be potentially good that, you know, money can be used for uh, uh, for the research or creating jobs and for look for changing perception. These are just some of the thoughts, okay? Anyways, uh, I'm going to go to the poll. I have three questions now, two by Matt. One is the original one, and I'm going to launch the poll now. Yes, the poll has been launched. 
you all have around 10 seconds or 15 seconds to answer and then I'll share. No, actually, I'll make it longer actually. Uh, sorry, because there are three questions now. The first two are maths questions. I'll wait another 10 seconds or 15 seconds as a lot of people are still reading the first and second questions. First question, sir. It's starting to stop. Three people left, I think, for, for the answers. Two more people. One more person. Ooh, it's a very tough one. Tough call, sorry. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I have ended the poll and now I'm going to share the results. And the results are the question, question number one, yes, eight people said yes, no, 14 people said no, uh, maybe 19 people said no, uh, uh, maybe, sorry. So the percentage is there, but I can also, you can see how many people said that. Number two, yes, 26 people said yes, that's a, that's a big majority, no, uh, four people, maybe 11. And is pangolin tourism a way to save the species? Yes, 10 people said yes. No, 12 people, maybe 19 people. And the same poll, the th question number three in the start was uh, yes, yes for 16 people. So it has gone down to 10 and 19, uh, six people said no. So these two things have changed. So here are your results. And I will share this video later. And again, thank you so much again, everybody, for your uh, input. And we all hope to stay in touch, perhaps. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a part of Pangolin Specialist Group. I think there's some of you are here from Pangolin Specialist Group too. I think Alisa is here too and a few others. And that's a, another platform for people to join, perhaps, if you want to continue lobbying for pangolin conservation and are involved with something with pangolins. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day, evening, night, morning, whatever you. Thanks a lot, Chavez. Thank it was you. a great talk, great meeting. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I'm thank you very much, Chavez. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.